Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's session, LibGuide and LibKale for Public Libraries. Great, I'm yeah, Caitlin Green. Still open, and I almost said to Debbie, "I'll stop. You want to stop?" Um, I'm Caitlin Kenny, a research and reference services coordinator from the Western New York Library Resources Council. With me is Jen Northup, member engagement services coordinator. We will be your moderators for today. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of some housekeeping. Jen and I are available to help you with any technical problems during the presentation, improving sound, captioning, and CE certificate. We do have captioning available to toggle the subtitles on or off. Click the show captioning button at the bottom of your screen and click it again to turn it off. If you have any questions for the presenter today, feel free to submit them through the chat. Um, we may not be able to get through all of the questions, but um, feel free to ask any questions you have. We can do follow up and um, feel free to use the chat for conversation and assistance and go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat now. All attendees are expected to follow a code of conduct. Now I'll link to that in the chat as well. To summarize, please treat all staff, event attendees, and speakers with respect. Those who are not adhering to the code of conduct will be removed from the webinar. We are recording today's webinar, and I will share the recording via email when it is available. Toward the end of the webinar, I will also share a link to the certificate of attendance and evaluation forms in the chat. Now that I've completed the housekeeping, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. Uh, Sarah Pro is the Consortium Sales Man Manager at Springshare, and she is here to give us a great presentation about LibGuys and LibCale. Thanks a bunch, Caitlin, and um, thanks a bunch to you too, Jen, for, for helping uh, monitor everything. I really appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is wonderful, once again, second week in a row to be back with Winnie Lurk and all the Winnie Lurk folk. Um, this brings me a great amount of joy and once again makes me a little bit nostalgic for Buffalo and all the good things that uh, um, Buffalo has, uh, including the food and the people and uh, the botanical garden, actually, since it's that time of year. But I digress. Um, I am here to provide you with an overview of LibGuides, uh, LibGuides CMS, and LibCal. Um, we're going to focus primarily on, uh, let's see here. Let me make sure I get the right thing shared here. Um, we're going to focus primarily on use cases as they pertain to public libraries today. But if that's not you, don't worry, because LibGuides works really, really well for all types of libraries and multiple use cases. Um, bear with me one moment here. I'm just gonna adjust something real quick, make sure that we can give you exactly what you need to see. All right. All right, so hopefully this should do it for me. All right. And with any luck, we are now seeing LibGuides for libraries. So that is where we're going to start today is with LibGuides and LibGuides CMS. Now, of course, LibGuides is our flagship product here at SpringShare. And LibGuides is all about content management for your libraries and getting the information, the databases, um, and the digital resources you've already paid for into the hands of your um of your patrons uh, wherever they are online. Now, LibGuides is a really easy to use platform as we're gonna see. I have a lot of really excellent examples for you today that we're gonna walk through from current, mem uh, current members, excuse me, from current clients. Um, and the most important thing that you probably should know about LibGuides is that the things that we are going to look at today uh, require you to have no knowledge of HTML, uh, CSS, or any really any kind of coding. Our interface is a drag and drop kind of interface. Everything's going to be on the screen for you. It allows you to build things and maintain your libguides in a way that is very intuitive um, and also keeps you from having to get IT involved. It's very self-service, uh, and that's the way that we think it should be. 
Now, LibGuides includes a lot of different pieces of functionality that you may have heard of if you've heard of us before, and I imagine you may have. Um, so some of the things that we will talk about are things like the A to Z database list. This is going to be a place where you can easily share all of the databases that you're subscribing to. It's a single place that your uh, patrons can go to to get access to all of those wonderful databases uh, in an easy fashion. Um, if I, we also recently updated, and by recently, I mean very recently, it's last Friday, as a matter of fact, we also updated the blogs and discussion board functionality for LibGuides and LibGuides CMS as well. And then we also have a bunch of other features for you too. So um, let me go ahead and we'll, we'll go ahead, we'll explore some examples together. So up first, we have Fairfax County uh, in Virginia, and this is their genealogy guide. Now, one of the things I want to point out, uh, and we'll see a couple different examples of this, but is the first thing here is your options for navigation when you are building a guide. So you have uh, this side navigation, which is an option. The other thing that we'll see in just a little bit is a tabbed navigation. So you have a couple different navigation styles that you can choose from. And in both navigation styles, you do have the ability to nest pages. So each of your guides um, it is going to, each of the pages within your guide is going to live under one of your navigation headings here. Now, within each of your guides, you can include a bunch of different information, such as images, videos, links to books in your catalog, uh, RSS feeds, polls, database links, and a whole whole lot more so it can make it really uh, interactive for your patrons um, and a place that they can come to do a lot of excellent learning, get more information, and also be directed to resources, again, that you're already paying for at your library. We can see here, actually, uh, that they are directing, they have events that are going on about genealogy at their library that they're directing their folks as well. And then they also have included here, and this is optional to include on your guide, but they've included what we like to refer to as the friendly librarian box. So this helps your patrons get to know who is curating this information um, and also get in contact with them if they have a particular interest, a particular need um, in this area. Now, one thing I do wanna point out, um, just because this is a question that I often get, is, is it possible to have like a nickname or something here rather than somebody's specific like first and last name? And yes, that is possible. So if you didn't want to include like your particular, your image and your name, you could include generically um, something like uh, genealogy librarians and have a generic contact information as well. So this is a really excellent example. They've done a really nice job as far as um, the different, uh, I should say their, their layout, making this work with their um, sort of branding and that sort of thing. Um, and another example I wanna show you is actually from the Clinton Essex Franklin Library System in New York. Um, I do try to pull examples uh, as locally as possible. Um, and this is their job search and career resources center. Now, I think this is a great example of LibGuides use in public libraries. Um, we do see LibGuides created for um, career resource centers for student, uh, to help students with learning um, and for curation around just a variety of different topics. Basically, we like to say that you can build guides on anything that you can think of. So um, there are a lot of different examples out there. Uh, and actually, um, the uh, one of the great things about LibGuides and LibGuides CMS is that when you subscribe, you can also become part of the community where you can see all of the different guides that have been built across our systems. You have the ability to um, actually um, share your guide, become inspired by the different guides that are on there, and even copy the information on those guides uh, with the permission of the authors, of course. But it's a very collaborative environment that allows you to get, get and see some great 
use cases. So as I mentioned, you have the ability to include a lot of excellent pieces of information here. We can see that they're curating um, here on their home page for their career resources, information from the web. They've also included some books from the library along the side here, and they have some databases down in this box as well. Now, as I mentioned be, uh, before on our other page, we have that side tab or that side navigation that we were just looking at. And then this is a tabbed navigation. Um, so you can see that each of these uh, each of these navigation items is going to be a different page within the guide. So we can see here that they've curated information about starting a small business, which is really great. Um, and they've also included options uh, for sharing this guide as well across social media too. So really nice way to share these resources um, and get this information that they have curated for their community out. Um, now, Greenberg Public Library is also in New York. And this is where I get to talk to you about LibGuide's upgraded big brother or big sister, um, LibGuide's CMS. So LibGuide's CMS is the... Uh, Let's say the uh, the advanced version uh, of LibGuides, and really it just comes with a, a couple more features and um, functionality to create things like a whole library website. So Greenberg Public Library's website that we are looking at right now is actually built off of LibGuide CMS. LibGuide CMS has features that are going to allow for better organization of your uh, site. So that's going to enable you to do things like this. So LibGuide CMS includes something called groups. This is going to allow you to organize your guides into groups. Each group has its own homepage, its own specific look and feel, its own dedicated URL. Um, so in, you could split out groups across things like particular interests, particular um, patron segments, so adults, children, things like that. You could split it out um, across things like services, even if you wanted. So for instance, you can see that they've done that here with children, teens, um, adult services. Um, you could also use groups in combination with one of LibGuide CMS other, other features, which is access restrictions and create a staff intranet. So one of the reasons that we see folks choose LibGuide CMS is because they need to be able to lock down either all or part of their system. And LibGuide CMS provides the ability to do that. So it allows you to be able to password protect uh, at the guide group and system level. It'll also allow you to be able to uh, protect your uh, protect at the guide group or system level with IP restrictions or with LibAuth. Now, LibAuth is something where you're going to be able to um, actually have your patrons authenticate against your data, uh, your uh, ILS, um, so that they can uh, basically prove that they are your patrons before they go any further to access something. But again, we also have folks who use this functionality in order to create a staff internet in addition to having all of their public information for their patrons. So there are a lot of extra uh, bells and whistles, shall we say, that come with LibGuide CMS that can help you create a very robust, very lovely, as we see here, um, <laughs> website for your library. Now, I am going to go ahead uh, and hop over to our Springy Library demo system, just so that we can explore a couple of the other features of LibGuides and LibGuide CMS. So this is the uh, homepage for LibGuides. And you can see here that this is, uh, that you can search guides um, either by group, um, this is how I know I'm in a LibGuide CMS system, by subject, by type, and by type we have course guides, general purpose guides, subject guides and topic, topic guides, and then also by the librarians who built the guides. Now, this these are the options that we have available in our system you do have the ability to toggle different options for your patrons on the back end. 
Now, again, groups are very helpful in organizing your guides, especially if you build as many guides as we do. Um, but they also allow each group, as I mentioned, to have a very customized, unique look and feel. So for instance, if I go into our archives group, we'll see that this has one guide that's been assigned to it, but it does have its own group homepage. So if I click here, we'll see that it has its own uh, its own banner. We'll see that it has a the sidebar has moved from the right to the left. It has different information on the sidebar um, and that it also has its own unique look and feel as well as embedded lib answers. Um, chat uh, widget. If you were here for my chat last week about LibChat, um, sorry, no pun intended, um, we talked a little bit about these sorts of things. So you have a lot of really great options, especially when it comes to organizing with groups in LibGuides CMS. Now, I am very gonna, uh, going to scroll very quickly to the bottom so that I can log into the back end so we can explore some things there. Pardon me while I do that. Now this is your LibGuides CMS or LibGuides and LibGuides CMS. They both look the same. The dashboard when you first log in. From here, you can navigate to everything that you need to do in the system pretty quickly. So you can create guides, you can edit any existing guides, you can explore any assets you may have in the system. And assets are going to be things like pictures, database links, um, books from the catalog that you've used. Um, and anything else pretty much that you have inserted already into a LibGuide or that somebody uh, in your system has created for a LibGuide. You'll also be able to generate any widgets so that you can put information from your LibGuides in other spots, either on your website, embed it in guides, different things like that. And then you can also easily view your image manager library. Now, a quick word about assets. And this is going to take a minute because we have a whole bunch in here in ours. Um, now, the really wonderful thing about LibGuides is that when you are building a guide, every time you add an asset, like we can see here, links, widgets, books, RSS feeds, all of those things that I said before that you can add to your guide to really make it multimedia, really make it um, very fleshed out and welcoming for uh, your patrons to uh, interact with. Every time that you add one to the system, it's going to be added to your asset list. And once it's in your asset list, you can reuse it time and time again without having to type the same thing in or add it in the same way over and over again. Basically, once it's in your system and you're building a guide, you have the ability to call on it um, just by looking for it in the system without having to retype in everything. So it's very, very convenient. LibGuides and LibGuides CMS have a bunch of areas of reuse that you are going to find incredibly useful. Um, one of the examples that I like to give is, uh, and uh, take this with a grain of salt, especially for LibCal, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. But if, for instance, you find yourself um, frequently having to update your hours as they are right now in multiple places across the web, LibGuides can actually make that a lot simpler. The way that you can do that, and I am actually going to go into one of my guides just so that we can check this out. The way that you can do that very simply is by creating a box like this one that we see here. And then this is now an asset in your system. What you can then do is reuse this box over and over across different guides, um, anywhere that you want in your system. And then when you use it, um, you are going to use it as a mapped box, and then you only have to change the original asset anytime your hours need to be updated. You don't have to remember all the 50 different places that you embedded your box um, or anything else. You just have to edit the original asset, and then those changes are going to cascade down to everywhere else that you have um, embedded this. So it makes long-term maintenance uh, of your guides really simple when you do um, use this, uh, this reuse feature. So that is one thing I do always really like to point out to folks. 
Now, I mentioned, of course, the A to Z database list, and that is something else that I want to show you. Um, we have two versions of the A to Z database list at the moment, and I am going to talk about the newer one because this is the one that we are moving towards. It also has a newer look and feel as well. So the A to Z database list, as I mentioned, is where your patrons can go to get uh, to get access and get information about all of the databases that you pay for at your library. So let me go here and we are going to pull up, oh, where are we here? Uh, let's see. And settings. There it is. So we're going to take a look at what this looks like. So the A to Z database list, you can ha you have a number of different options that you can toggle on and off in terms of ways that folks can filter for different databases. You'll see that we provide a keyword search, subjects, types, and also they can search by vendor if they wish. Now, I do want to say here that things like subjects, um, topics, and tags are things that you are going to define in your LibGuides or LibGuides CMS system. So these are very, um, it's very flexible. We are not going to tell you how you are going to define these things. You're going to come up with those yourself um, or use those, use those words that you are already using to describe. So you see here that we have a lot of databases. Um, some of the features here of the A to Z database list that I always really like to highlight for folks are the ability to set things like featured databases. These can be things either that you know that folks use very heavily, whether those are general reference databases um, or things maybe that you're trialing that you want to get a lot of good usage data out of and you want to try to pin uh, focus people's attention towards. You'll also see that we have things here, uh, tags for new, featured, and actually trial databases as well. I wonder if there's uh, one around here. And you can also add your own tags. So we have added a tag here for a full text database. Uh, the A to Z database list can also include an icon legend that's going to uh, show up on your sidebar here and let people know what these different icons mean. Now, you can also provide additional information about each of the databases that you provide access to. So well, you'll see we have additional info here. We also have specified permitted use, as well as any tips you want to provide, such as um, information about how to access from online, or excuse me, how to access from home if that's permitted, things of that nature. Um, and of course, you can provide uh, or I should say, you can also use um, any proxied links as well when you're setting up your databases so that folks can easily get into those right away. So the A to Z database list in general, incredibly useful, great way to help people kind of figure out, uh, get to exactly what they need for their project projects or their research interests. All right. Now, the last thing that I want to talk to you about in LibGuides and LibGuides CMS um, is the different statistics that you have available to you in this system, because uh, as somebody coming from an e-resources background, I am very acutely aware um, just the type of information that we're being asked to collect and the types of things that you need in order to um, prove the usefulness <laughs> of the things that you're looking at. So. For your statistics, um, now, I, if I have not already clarified, I am in a LibGuide CMS system, so I have all of these statistics available. Um, but And LibGuide CMS only statistics include things like sessions, browser and operating system, searches, which is one of the most interesting ones. I'll show you that in just a second. Um, and then we also have the e-reserves active in here, which is an, <clears throat> excuse me, which is an add-on for LibGuides and LibGuides CMS, so you can disregard both this one and this one. Now, so you will have access as a LibGuides uh, subscriber, you would have access to the statistics for your homepage, your A to Z database page, guides, uh, assets, and your content summary. Now, I mentioned the searches um, statistics, and this one I do think is incredibly helpful. So let me get a good 
chunk of time here. I'm going to go back to January and I'm going to run this report. Now, the types of information that is going to surface in your searches is, of course, going to be the different sort searches that have been performed on your site or within your LibGuide system. This is going to show you where that search was performed. So AZ, that means this was performed in your A to Z list. This was per AI, so this means uh, this was performed within the system, so with, from within a LibGuide instead. And this is also going to give you the uh, number of searches that was performed with this particular um, search term. Now, this is very helpful because this is going to let you know the types of searches that are being done in your system. Uh, and then you can kind of look at this and go, depending on how many searches have been completed or with this particular term, it, it gives you an idea of the types of things that people are looking for. It's also an opportunity for you to look at this and go, do we have guides on this topic? Is this something that is coming up more frequently? If we do have guides on this topic, um, is this something that folks are getting to and using? Um, again, you have a guides report, so you'll be able to see if folks are actually hitting the guide. Say maybe we do have a guide on AI. Um, so you'll be able to correlate those things and see if those are happening. And if not, it's going to give you the opportunity to say, maybe we need to rename a guide or maybe we need to build a guide around a particular topic. Um, now, if we're looking at, you can see we've had a lot of A to Z searches. If this is also another opportunity to look at this from uh, maybe a collection development kind of standpoint and go, oh, we've had a lot of folks who are looking for um, mental health resources or things like that within our A to Z database list. Um, we don't happen to have an A to Z database that, or excuse me, we don't happen to have a database that covers uh, mental health in any great detail or things like that. Maybe that's something that we need to look into. So there are a lot of excellent pieces of information that these statistics can surface for you. Uh, now, there are a whole host of other tools, features, and resources within LibGuides and LibGuides CMS that um, I am not going to be able to cover today because now we are going to flip over to LibCal, which is also an incredible system. Uh, but what I do want you to know is that if you are interested in LibGuides or LibGuides CMS, um, I'm going to provide some follow-up information uh, for Caitlin to share out so you can take a look at that at your leisure. Um, I am also available to y'all if you would like um, to book a one-on-one -on -one, um, a time for a one-on-one -on -one walkthrough uh, or anything else, um, any questions that you may have, how this could work for your use case, if you'd like additional examples from public libraries or uh, libraries of your particular type that are using this, I'm happy to do that. So uh, consider this today your uh, flyby of LibGuides and LibGuides CMS at 30,000 feet. And if you'd like a deeper dive, I'm happy to provide that at any time. And Caitlin can get you in touch with me. Now, the next thing that we are going to look at is LibCal. And again, this is purely in a public library context, but LibCal works beautifully for everybody. We have um, academics, K-12s, uh, special libraries uh, using LibCal, so it is a very flexible system. Now, LibCal is all about calendaring and reservations. Uh, it consists of four parts. Those are events management, spaces reservations, uh, appointment, one-on-one -on -one appointment booking, and a centralized hours management module. Now, I know that I just told you how you could manage your hours uh, in an online presence via Lib, uh, LibGuides, but I'm gonna show you an easier way to do it via LibCal. Now, I do have some really nice examples for you as well. And we're actually gonna go back and visit our friends at Greenberg uh, because they are also using LibCal in addition to LibGuides CMS. Um, so, Let's go ahead and hop right into those examples. We'll spend some time going through them, going through the different ways that the system works. And then we'll also spend just a little bit of time on the back end as well. Now, first up is the Niagara Falls Public Library in Canada, very close to some of y'all. Um, and th they are using the uh, LibCal events uh, piece to advertise different if thing, events that are going on at their library. 
they are also using it to collect registrations. So LibCal is very flexible on the event side. It allows you to do both. Um, it also handles in-person uh, events, online events, and hybrid events. So very flexible there in terms of the types of things that you can advertise and a registration that you can collect at your library. So I am a gardener um, in case you, my... Uh, <laughs> In case my comment about the botanical garden was missed at the beginning, um, I am a very avid gardener. So if I was interested in this uh, registering for this senior gardening series, we could go ahead and begin our registration here. We see that this is uh, the registration is required and there are currently 25 seats available. Now, if I begin my registration, we'll see that this is a very short form. Um, I'm being asked to provide my full name, my email, and my phone number. The thing that I want you to know here about uh, events registration in LibCal is that these forms uh, for your events are customizable. Um, it does require a, at minimum, a full name and either email, phone number, or library barcode. So it has to have two pieces of information because that's how we um, identify people in the system. Uh, but everything else after that, and you can actually have up to 20 custom questions for these forms, um, everything else is customizable for you. Now, the other thing here is that you can actually have as many of these registration forms as you want. So for instance, if uh, Niagara Falls Public Library wanted to have a form that was specific for their gardening series, um, say maybe they wanted to ask what somebody's favorite flower was, um, if they have, you know, any sort of known allergies or things like that, they could certainly do that. Then they could also have a form for registering um, for children's events. So very nice to be able to have those kinds of different options. All right. Now, the other thing I want to point out here, just a couple more things on their page, is that they are using a LibCal hours widget to advertise the hours of their different branches. Um, it's very easy once you actually have your hours in the module to um, get them syndicated out across multiple places across your site, um, whether that's LibGuides or something else. Um, you can also, of course, advertise your hours directly on your LibCal page. Now, they are using their one-on-one -on -one, uh, appointment booking to book virtual appointments. I love their use of this. Um, this helps them, helps their patrons get that expert tech time uh, with their librarians and across uh, a couple of their different branches here, which is really lovely. And then they have um, an add-on for LibCal, which is our equipment booking module. Um, and they're actually using that to book story walks. Uh, this is a really interesting and really exciting use of this particular piece of LibCal um, and just something that I like to highlight because uh, it's a very inventive use of that particular module. Now, uh, this is Live Oak Public Libraries in Georgia, and we're going to look at two different examples of the next piece of LibCal, which is the space booking module or the space, space bookings. So, this is one way that space bookings can look. We can see this is their Garden City Library. Um, this is a meeting room and they have a current, they have a variable capacity here. Now, what we are looking at is the next time that this uh, particular meeting room is available, we can see that this color green uh, indicates it's available. If it was red, that would indicate it's unavailable. And if I put in a request here, so if I selected a particular time, um, it would be yellow. Couple things about space booking here. Uh, I'm going to go through this actually on our demo system just because I don't want to actually take up any time for many patrons. Um, but this is customizable in terms of your colors. And um, you have options here as far as how your um, how your hours display. So we can either do this in hourly increments like we see here or it can actually be um, period based. So you can decide if, if it's something more like maybe you have 
um, set periods that you would like to assign that are like maybe an hour or two hours long, you also have the ability to do that instead. So it can either display like this or it can be something slightly different and more customized to your library. Now, this is one example. Um, and I'm actually going to go and click on the Garden City Library meeting room. Let's see. OK, that's all right. Um, this is one example. However, we can see that this is actually they're using this to reserve rooms at all of the different branch libraries in their system. Um, this is one of the really nice things about LibCal, LibCal is that it can handle multiple locations, uh, scheduling and reserving rooms with great ease. Now, again, I'm going to go through this whole process in our demo system just so you can see what it looks like on the patron side. Um, but it is very simple to do. Now, this is another example of uh, the reservation system in a multi branch system. This is Arapahoe Libraries in California. And you can see here that they've done something a little bit more visual so that uh, their patrons, you know, uh, have those visual cues for where they're booking. So here they've laid out pictures with all of their different branches, and then they have easy, quick links to booking meeting rooms and study rooms. Um, I use Cobol Library pretty regularly. I like theirs. So we can go ahead and click on that. Now, this is nice. You can see here that they've gone ahead and customized this to match their own branding. And there are a couple things that I want to point out here. So for their different meeting rooms, in addition to the names, um, they've also included capacity information for this space. And we see that there are two icons. The, this icon indicates that this space is handicapped accessible uh, and that this one, the, that the space provides power so that they can plug in things like their phone or their laptop or things like that while they have this space. If we click on this, on this room, we'll be able to get additional information about the space. So they have included a picture. Um, these are very interesting and always very fun for me to take a look at. We have had everything from nice static pictures that show the space exactly as it is, um, to 360 degree views, uh, including the smiling young man that was taking the picture. That was very fun. Uh, so your ability to upload different images of your space here uh, is, is very flexible. You can include information about the space. Uh, this is also particularly helpful if there are different setup options available, you know, maybe chairs in a round versus chairs in an audience format, that kind of thing. And then again, we'll also get uh, what these icons mean here as well. Now, I am going to show you something in just a bit, which is a uh, which is uh, we released uh, functionality we we released late last year, but. Um, you actually now have the ability to create your own icons. Um, we have a whole library of these icons available to you, then you can decide what they mean. In addition to being able to add these icons to your spaces for things like um, uh, one of our libraries in Texas indicated that the space has air conditioning, um, for instance, or maybe that um, food and drink is allowed, things of that nature. Um, these icons, can also become filters when your patrons search on the front end. So it's not just letting them know what's there. It also is a way for them to be able to find the spaces that they're most interested in reserving. All right. Now, uh, another piece of LibCal, of course, that I have mentioned several times is the hours management module. This is the St. Petersburg Library System, and they are another um, multi-branch public library system. And you can see here that they are using this to advertise their weekly hours across their different branches. We can see that they have um, different hours for the different branches. Um, this is a, a, a widget that they are using to just direct people to their hours on this particular page. We can see we can also view this in a monthly hour format as well. Um, Again, we'll take a look at this one a little bit closer on the back end in just a moment. Um, the hours widget makes it so, or excuse me, hours management module makes it so easy to manage your hours. Now, and I see I didn't pull up the right one, but that's okay. Let me go ahead and get the Springy Library pulled up here. One moment. Uh, 
All right. And let me get into my hometown library. Okay. So this is the SpringShare uh, demo library. And this is one way that you can choose to advertise events and different things that are going on at your library. You have a bunch of different options here for you. We have uh, this day or list view by default, but you'll also have options for things like card view, which is very popular because it calls attention to how many seats are left for any events that require registration. We also have a monthly kind of agenda view as well as a weekly view for your events. One of the nice things here is that you can, you both you as staff and your patrons can get an iCal feed of your calendar, 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 <laughs> or a particular filtered view of a calendar um, that's going to keep them updated on all the wonderful things you're doing at your library. So all they would have to do then is click this link and then get the subscription to this calendar here. Now, I mentioned they have different options for filtering. So we they can filter, of course, by category and category um, like subject uh, in LibGuides is something that you are going to be able to define. So however you talk about your events is however you're going to be able to define them in the system. We have this system text customized as who this event is for. However, uh, by default, you would see this as audience. So they're also going to be able to filter by audience. And the same thing here, you're going to define how you speak about your audience. So you'll be able to sort by that. If you are a multi-branch library system, they can search by branch. And then they can also sort by online events versus in-person events as well. So lots of different options for that here. Now, I mentioned uh, that we were going to go ahead and take a look at how booking a space worked. And we're going to do that. And we're going to book a space in our Springy library. Now, what we've taken a look at so far with both Arapahoe um, and um, our other friends uh, at Live Oak was what we refer to as the traditional booking grid. What we have now, as also as an option, is the new search-based booking interface. So for this, again, we're going to choose our location. And you'll see that this interface is rather different. Um, this works really beautifully on mobile devices. Um, of course, actually, everything works pretty good on mobile devices since uh, it is designed to resize based on the size of your screen. Uh, but this one was specifically designed with mobile devices and mobile users in mind. So here, folks can either search by time or they can search by space. Uh, if you happen to have any Lib, uh, LibCal users who are regularly using seats uh, or reserving seats and they happen to know a space name by heart, uh, and I hope that happens for all of you. Now, from here, we can choose a category. So, for instance, uh, let's see. Well, I didn't want that one. I wanted this one. Here we go. So, we can choose a category. Uh, in this case, I would like a study room. If we know our capacity, so um, say maybe I need a space for one to five people, we can choose that there. If if there is a zone, and for zones, I normally see things like first floor, second floor, east wing, west wing, things of that nature. Um, zone is optional. It's not required. Uh, they can fill in a zone if they wish. The system is going to default to today's date and a time that is within um, about half an hour of the current time. So you'll see that we have, uh, we're looking, the system's going to look for something between 11 and 1 p.m. As I mentioned, uh, those icons can be used as filters in their searches. So if I wanted to try to find something where I could also uh, have a cup of coffee while I was doing some research, I could go ahead and check this icon as well. So once I'm happy with my search, I can go ahead and take a look. And LibCal is going to pull up information about the study rooms that are available. Uh, now, if there is a cost associated with the booking that will be shown up front, um, otherwise we can either book now or we can click on the study room name to get into more information about the room as we saw before. Now, this pulled up, uh, this actually pulled up two matches for me, which is very, very nice. In the event that there are no matches uh, that for what the patron input, 
it is important for you to know that they will not hit a dead end. It's not just going to say, nope, nothing available, try again later. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to suggest something relatively soon after their their search. So say, for instance, nothing came up that was available to, between 11 and 1, but there was a space that, ha that was available at 2 p.m., it would show me those options. Um, so your patrons are never going to not have anything show because um, we know how frustrating that is to just kind of be like, well, too bad, try again. Um, so they will always have something that shows for them rather than nothing. So if I did want to go ahead and book my study room, um, let's see, it'll see for this one, I do have to select times on the hour or half hour. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. We'll see from here, I get back to my traditional booking grid and I am going to select my time. Now, the times that I am being asked to select, um, this is something, these are settings that are set on the back end for LibCal. So again, the system is very flexible. However, you currently work with your bookings. So for instance, if you offer bookings every 15 minutes rather than every half an hour, no problem, system can handle that. Um, or if you only offer bookings on the hour, system can also handle that, no problem. But so I'm going to select the time that I want. We can see that I could have it clear through to one o'clock if I want. And then I'm going to go ahead and submit those times. Now for here, I'll be presented with some terms and conditions. And then I can go ahead and continue on to complete my booking. This booking form, as you may be able to guess, is fully customizable, although we do need full name and either email, phone number, or library barcode. And then after that, um, these questions are based on the room itself. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and complete this information here. And this is my SpringShare email. So if you do need to get a hold of me for any reason, feel free to go ahead and jot that down again. If you forget um, or if or if you don't think you need to get in touch with me and then decide later you do, Caitlin can also get you in touch with me. So no worries there. So I'm going to fill this in and then we'll submit some information and then I'm going to go ahead and submit my booking. So important thing to know about LibCal is that LibCal does not have your patrons create a patron account in the system. What it's going to do is it's going to send them an email with their booking reservation. In that email, it is going to, by default, include a link to cancel that e uh, cancel or change that um, reservation if needed. Um, and of course, we can be taken back to the, the screen to make another booking if necessary. Uh, but that is how that information is going to be communicated to your patron is via email. So um, for this information, uh, so for this booking here, uh, we can something else that's important for me to point out is that this is going into the system as already confirmed. Now, uh, space bookings in LibCal can uh, be mediated or not, um, and it's not an all or nothing situation. You can it, actually have that by individual room if you want. So if you wanted some rooms to um, be confirmed just based purely on their availability in the system, like what I just did, you can do that. And then if there are some spaces that you want to be um, mediated uh, because either they require a complicated setup, they're only available to certain groups, things like that, you can set up those parameters. Uh, the wonderful thing about LibCal is its flexibility and your ability to set up parameters that are specific to those um, your usage uh, already of the things that you're doing at your library when it comes to making space bookings. So important things for you to know. Now, let me quickly uh, <laughs> talk through a couple of things here on the back end, and then I promise I'll address any questions um, that have come up in chat. So this is your LibCal dashboard. And from your LibCal dashboard, you can uh, see any upcoming events or any upcoming appointments that have been scheduled with you in this, through the system. <coughs> Excuse me. What I want to get to here, though, is that hours management module. So for as an admin, I am going to go to our admin menu, which looks like a gear icon. And from there, I'm going to go down to hours. Now, 
This really is very simple, but it helps an incredible amount, as I mentioned earlier, especially if you are currently updating your hours in lots of different places across your, uh, across your website or your web presence in general. Now, the examples that I've shown you so far for hours are things where we're looking at multiple branches, but it also works really well if you are a single library with service points with different hours. So, for example, we have here the Springy Library, and then within the Springy Library, we have a circulation desk, reference desk, study rooms, et cetera, that all have slightly different hours. So, don't worry um, if the large branch, multi-branch situation does not apply for you, this still can work really effectively for you. So what we do here is we're gonna start off by um, adding, defining a new library up here. Once we do that, we can then add departments to that library as you see here. Um, the system is very hierarchical in that way. As a matter of fact, all aspects of this system are very hierarchical. So I think it'll make a lot of sense to y'all. Um, and then from here, we can uh, add our hours and any exceptions. So let's say, for instance, um, we, you can see we have set our opening hours, and we are using a, uh, a template for that that we have called our standard hours. But let's say we need to add an exception. So exceptions can be things like holidays, holiday closures. They could also be, um, and I'm saying this because it's uh, nearly June, and I feel like we're all out of the woods, even you folks in Buffalo. Um, it could also be things like snow days. <laughs> um, you know, like, hey, uh, we got four feet of snow last night, and no, we will not be open today. So you'll choose the date of your exception. You'll choose what your opening hours are, if you have <laughs> any. Uh, and then you can, also uh, you can also add a note to let folks know why you're closed that day. So for instance, we can add that. And then from here, you can either add it for a specific location, helpful again in a multi-branch situation, or you can make it system-wide. So very easy to create um, exceptions that apply to one place or multiple places very, very quickly. Um, you can also pre-program your exceptions if they are holidays or things of that nature. Um, so for instance, you'll see that we have one coming up here for, um, for the fourth for holidays. So also good to know that as well. Now, once you have your holiday, your hours and things like that in the system, as we see, we have these all in here, you're going to be able to syndicate out your information using the widgets that I've mentioned a couple times during our chat today. So you can do that in a couple different ways. Um, our widgets are really easy to create. Again, follows the idea that you don't have to know HTML, CSS, any sort of COVID coding in order to create these. Basically, you'll choose how you want them to display, whether that's just today or maybe a daily hours view. Uh, and you'll, if you have multiple locations, for the daily hours, you'll choose what you want to show. Maybe I just want to show, show my Springy library. And then all you need to do is generate your code. We'll get a preview here down at the bottom, what that's gonna look like. And then all I need to do is copy and paste this embed code anywhere that's going to accept that. So you could paste this very easily into, um, into a libguide, absolutely. You could also post it, uh, paste it into anywhere that is going to accept embed code on your website. So um, very easy to get that information out there. Uh, our widgets are not static, which is an important thing to know. So anytime that you change your hours or have those hours fluctuations, they are going to automatically, your widgets are automatically going to update wherever they've been embedded. So it's not a situation that every time you update your hours, you have to update your widgets. So that is very important for long-term maintenance. All right, so I do want to leave some time for questions, um, thinking we may have a couple, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull open chat and see if we do have anything here. I think I need to the chat, yeah, or uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to input them in the chat, but I have a question for you, Sarah. Yes. You briefly mentioned the 360 images. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little more about that? I'm really curious about it. Oh yeah, so I'm I'm honestly we don't have that's not something that oh, that's okay. in. Um, I'm not sure. 
I'm honestly not sure what he used to do that, if it was like a GoPro or something else. Um, but it was it was really neat because you could move it around so you could see the entire space. And then whenever whenever he had taken it, uh the the back of what I would think of as the back of the image was just him smiling, holding this like camera. Um, it was, it was the cutest thing, but because it was whatever it was that he had uploaded, um, it was a standard image format worked great. So yeah, okay. I wish I could provide you more information about that, but unfortunately that wasn't us. It was just a really creative use. <laughs> well, I just wondered that it, could, it never occurred to me that you could even upload a 360 or like a, panorama style image. Uh, I thought that was a really great idea. So it was really brilliant. Um if I could find that if I can find that again, that's a big if um I will I, I will share that. But it was pretty incredible. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh you're welcome. Any questions for Sarah about Libtail or LibGuides in your libraries? Looking like, oh, um, so I have a question about pricing that was sent to me privately. Sure. Uh, what factors affect pricing for these products? Is there a standard type of pricing? Um, does it change depending on the size of a library? Do you have different pricing for libraries as opposed to systems? That's a great question, um, and the, and an important one. Um, so. Pricing for LibGuides and LibGuides CMS is based off of number of registered card holders for public libraries. Um, and those that's for, I'm gonna say that's for individual libraries. For systems, that's a little bit of a longer conversation normally just because we try to take into account um, a couple different things. Um, you know, whether it's going to be multiple libraries working in the system or whether we're talking about, uh, you know, multiple LibGuide systems for uh, a, a library system. Yeah. So it, it just kind of depends there. Um, I will say, though, uh, Winnie Lurk uh, members have a discount available to them. So uh, if that is something that we end up talking about and you're a Winnie Lurk member, definitely let me know. Um, I have a running list, but uh, it always helps me out if you let me know up front. LibCal, on the other hand. Um, so LibCal is not priced based on uh, your registered card holders. LibCal is priced based on basically what you need. Um, LibCal starts with, a, with our base system, which is five events calendars, um, five appointment schedulers, which I know we didn't talk about too much today. Again, if anybody wants a more in-depth dive, happy to do that. Um, and then also five spaces, we uh, as well as the hours management module, of course, but you only need one of those. Um, so LibCal then, we can increment any of those parts. Um, say, for instance, if you if the five events calendars is good, the five appointment schedule is good, but you have 100 spaces, we have pricing for that. So it's that's more of a pick and mix, mix and match um, kind of situation. Um, but we try to customize that more to uh, whatever the library's need is there. Okay. That sounds great. Thank you. You're welcome. If anyone is interested, you can always email me. I can connect you with Sarah um, uh, to, to sort things out. Um, we don't have any other questions. Uh, so we will end this here. I will. I did put in the chat the link to the certificate of attendance and the evaluation form. Uh, if you didn't see those, just scroll up a little bit and you should find them. And I will also be sending them out via email as well when I send out the recording. All right. Thank you so much Sarah, for another great presentation. I really appreciate it. I learned some stuff about LibGuides and LibCal too that I found really interesting. And 
No, I kind of want to see if I can convince the rest of Wing Lars to use LibKale for some of our services. Uh, well, thank you. Have a great week and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. And um, thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate y'all.